welcome to the Networks Friday Forum. Thank you so much for joining. This is the first of a series of forums that we are hosting weekly on Fridays through June 25th. We have an amazing group, eight panels during the month of June, starting with this federal panel today. But before we start, I want to acknowledge all of the hard work the network staff have put into this series, especially Joelle Balam Schwam and Emily Levine. I would also like to thank our sponsors and nonprofit partners who generous, generously supported the series. And please check out our exhibitor gallery in the link in the chat. One program note to mention is that we unfortunately have had to cancel this afternoon's keynote conversation with Alicia Garza due to a last minute personal emergency. But today I am so happy to be moderating a discussion about the federal landscape during these unprecedented times and unpack the pending infusion of new resources with the FY22 budget and the proposed American Jobs Plan. During the first half of the conversation, we will be joined by Peggy Bailey and Richard Cho, Senior Advisors to the HUD Secretary, followed by Diane Yantel, President and CEO of the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Thank you so much, Peggy and Richard, for joining us today. Uh, we have Please join us on camera. Great, thank you. It's so great to see both of you. We have a long history with each of you at the network and are so thrilled you have both taken the time to be with us today. To start us off, we'd love to hear, both of you have had fascinating career paths that have intersected with the network over the years. Tell us about how you got your current roles and what gets you most excited about the work that you are doing now at HUD. Sure. So thanks, Laura. And hello, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be with uh, Shinny today. Um, so yeah, so as Laura said, uh, I have had a long history with Shinny. I think I put on Twitter, it's through uh, four, five jobs in four places um, over the last almost 20, 20 years. Uh, before uh, coming to HUD, which this is my first time in federal service, I was at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities as the uh, Vice President for Housing Policy, and then uh, and before that, I was at the center working on the intersection of housing and health for the um, uh, for uh, for for the connecting the dots project at the center. But um, the bulk of my engagement with Shinny has been in the homelessness space, uh, working first at the National Alliance in Homelessness back when, as I like to say, uh, when Richard and I were both working on housing and health before it was cool. Uh, and, uh, uh, and now, uh, and then, um, and, and there I focused mostly on homelessness and mental health and then worked at CSH um, with Richard uh, on, um, on the intersection, the policy intersection of housing and health and really did a lot of work once the Affordable Care Act was passed to help uh, Medicaid understand housing and housers understand Medicaid and try to move the ball along at the state level um, to connect uh, Medicaid with more services and did a lot of work in New York as you guys were sorting through uh, the Medicaid redesign work. Uh, and, and so, and really what gets me up every day is thinking about the people that we all serve. Um, the work, what's, what's made me stay in this, in, in the housing space has been understanding that there's a group of people that, but for housing, um, have a hard time engaging in services and without services have a hard time staying housed and to no fault of their own. The fault is with the systems and how we silo things and the burdens that we often put on people. And, the, and so the work that I get energized by is how to unthread those barriers and, and help create more connectivity so that people can have uh, housing. Um, the you know, housing as a basic need is something, is unfortunately a new idea. And, uh, and that is a shame. Uh, people, housing is a fundamental piece of everyone's life and everyone um, deserves a safe place to live. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Peggy. Uh, Richard. Yeah, well, um, let me say this, Laura, first of all, thank you for having me here. And as Peggy noted, it always feels like a homecoming when we uh, get to speak to a crowd in New York. Um, as, as you all know, I mostly started my career in this field in, in New York, uh, working closely with the network, but also with 
um, CSH and many other um, government and nonprofit entities um, who I assume are somewhere in the audience here today um, and just always um, a lot of familiar friends. Um, New York was such a great place uh, for me to learn about how to pair housing and services and to put together resources. There's so much sophistication and opportunity uh, innovation in New York always. Um, and you know, uh, you, you go to the rest of the country and um, there is nowhere near not only the resources, but the data and the ingenuity that you have in New York. So uh, New York uh, state and city are really lucky um, uh, in, in having so many uh, opportunities here. Um, I'll say it's really exciting to be able to work with Peggy um, in this new capacity. Uh, she's like my work sister from another mister, you know, like we've, we've like worked on so many similar things in the past. And, um, and I'll just say this, like, this is my second go around in the federal government. And as Peggy noted, it's, it's like, this is a, a new day and a different, different uh, day. I, I got to work at the Interagency Council on Homelessness during the Obama administration. Um, and at that time, uh, the idea that housing um, had anything to do with health was still a new idea. It wasn't cool, as Peggy said. It was, you know, a lot of the work then was trying to make the case for why um, housing um, had impacts on health. Uh, we also were trying to end homelessness, but without any significant federal new resources, right? I mean, we were under sequestration rules, if you folks remember that. So um, Congress had put um, caps on any new discretionary spending, uh, and we were always told, like, assume that you're going to get a 5% cut to the federal programs, not any increases. And so here we were trying to talk about any homelessness and yet like the prospect of any new resources. And then, at, you know, I think what that scarcity does is it, it hits the home, uh, housing uh, and the homelessness systems against each other. It makes us feel like we have to choose between whether we could address homelessness or prevent people from housing loss uh, or um, increase home ownership, right? It was like you, you end up having to fight between different parts of HUD and the housing sector and so coming into the Biden administration, uh, working with colleagues like Peggy, where um, number one, uh, you know, uh, there's a recognition that housing is a fundamental human right um, by the president. Uh, number two, uh, we have significant opportunities to scale resources and this administration is continuing to fight to bring new resources to the table across all fronts. We are not uh, making false choices between having to end homelessness and address other housing needs, but we're gonna do it all. Um, and that's, that's our focus. Uh, people ask, what's your priority? And I said, our priority is to house all of America. I mean, that is, that is our priority. Um, and then I think the last thing I'll just say is, you know, we're, we're now at a time when housing is recognized as healthcare and we no longer have to make the case, but it's really about what do we do with that knowledge and how do we actually advance policy? And uh, we all um, recognize that we at the federal government need to do our part along with communities to address systemic racism. Uh, and so to have an administration that from day one has acknowledged that uh, America has a long legacy of systemic racism and that we need to address that um, across the government uh, and including in housing policy just feels like a new day. So Laura, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, you know, um, uh, I spent the last year working on the front lines um, in homelessness and COVID response, and I'm just as tired as anybody, but like I'm energized by the opportunity. Today. Thank you so much. It's almost like we need to pinch ourselves and realize we have awoken in a new day. Um, I so agree with everything that you both said, housing, being healthcare, actually being out in the mainstream conversation, the importance of housing, not competing with the homelessness system, like under the leadership of President Biden, we can actually achieve so much and we couldn't be more thrilled to really have both of you in these roles and your familiarity with New York and of course the country. Uh, so thank you for, for, for being at HUD. Um, Peggy, I wanted to start with, can you comment really on Secretary Fudge's vision for HUD and how it promotes racial equity and helps to undo systemic racism and are you feeling like it'll be a different approach from the Obama administration? I know Richard just talked about sequestration and the, and the constraints on spending, but from a policy perspective, are you, are you sensing anything different? Yeah, sure. So I don't know that it's so much different as what Richard laid out, right? It's just a new environment. And so that we, we're, we are constantly talking about what happened during the Obama administration and, and the foundation that was laid 
and that you know some of that was on has been on pause. And so how do we restart these things and build upon them? And then as Richard said, now we have resources to actually actualize those things. We're not, you know, we're, we're, we can actually, we can, we can, we're bringing money to the table, which is, uh, which is so important. So I don't know that it's, it, it's, it's different as much as now we can take that whole approach to housing and making sure that people and really um, mean what we say around people um, people being able to be housed. You know, Secretary Fudge is uh, her vision is really centered in people and the and the people that HUD serves and how do we expand uh, beyond the people that HUD serves since it's such a fra small fragment of the entire rent and and housing population. Like we should be thinking about everybody and how do we expand the pie, not just in the homelessness and rental assistance space, but also in the home ownership. Uh, space and our colleague Elena Macargo uh, heads up the work over uh, in the single family space and trying to get you know open that door to home ownership for uh, for for low income low and moderate income families. And so her vision is that is is how do we make sure that HUD isn't the barrier to help but is the open door that our door is is open and uh, and that we don't hide away from the problems that exist in many HUD assisted housing and public housing, but we lean in to fix it. Uh, the, the thing that, uh, that she says to us is that she's about action and expects us to be about action. Uh, and we aren't passive bystanders on, in the housing space. We are, we, are, we are actors and we have agency and we're here, um, we're here to help. Uh, and so if you've uh, seen her in her recent uh, uh, travels, you can tell that she is, you know, she's energized by um, making a difference in people's lives. And that's what HUD is here. It's a, she always says it's a new day at HUD where we're not, uh, where, we, where we're here for, uh, for, for the people and, um, and are centered in what, uh, in what people need. And so that then leading into the race equity conversation, we recognize that um, that uh, we disproportionately serve people of color. So if we're not doing a service to the people that are in HUD assisted housing, then we're failing when it comes to racial equity. So to spin that then, what we need to do is be able to expand our reach and ensure that what, rather than creating barriers to access, we're, we're breaking down those barriers so that people of color, low income people um, are Ha have access to, ha to housing and aren't, um, and, and, and we're allowed to talk about like the paternalism of federal programs. And we're allowed to talk about what asset building looks like for black and brown families. And, um, and, and, and that's, that's just been um, fantastic to have the federal government acknowledging maybe past mistakes that we've made and how to correct for those is what ra racial equity and equity broadly for all uh, marginalized populations is really about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, lo I love that HUD of action, having agency, recognizing the past. Um, it's, it's amazing. It, we're so happy to have Secretary Fudge at the helm, really overseeing all of the programs in what seems to be a very integrated way and really trying to combat systemic racism in the programs. Um, given that vision, the FY22 budget was released last Friday and there are sweeping increases across the HUD budget, awesome to see, uh, that goes a, go a long way to combat inequality. And Richard, can you detail for us what is in the budget for homelessness and for supportive housing? Yeah, so, um, you know, I know, uh, trying to keep a lot of the, the um, things straight is, is often challenging. Um, we had a CARES Act, a December package, the American Rescue Plan, and then now the president's proposed FY22 budget, as well as the American Jobs Plan. Um, so, and, and I'll, I'll uh, sort of ask for some Peggy's help in keeping things straight, but um, I, I think it's really important to think about all these things as a package and how they all um, address different needs. Um, in the American Rescue Plan, we had um, 70,000 emergency housing vouchers, $5 billion in homeless grants that we provided through the HUD, the home program. So a little bit different, new kinds of resources. Um, that's what we have now. We have awarded, um, hoping communities are uh, able to begin thinking about how to use both those vouchers and the $5 billion in home grants to be able to both address immediate term needs of people who are experiencing homelessness, 
through the vouchers, um, along with um, CARES Act money that's still remaining, um, and then use the home dollars um, to help um, seed additional new development of supportive housing. That is um, what we're one of the things we're hoping to see, including in some communities through the conversion of hotels that um, have been used as knock-on to shelter. Um, in uh, FY22, um, we're uh, now talking about not a special rescue package, but the president's budget request. There's a, uh, a half a million, uh, or sorry, $500 million, half a billion dollars. I, again, I'm, you know, from working from the Obama years, I keep uh, confusing my millions and billions. Um, so we're, we're in, the, uh, exactly. in the billion space now. So half a billion dollar increase for the continuum of care program. Um, in, uh, so there's, uh, you know, the continuum of care program has remained at about $3 billion for the last several years. Um, we're asking for a, a $500 million increase um, to the continuum of care program. There's a request for 200,000 additional housing choice vouchers um, that would have uh, um, some preferences for homelessness and people with uh, fleeing domestic violence. But these would be not emergency housing vouchers, but regular housing choice vouchers um, that would be awarded. Again, 200,000 uh, new vouchers in a single year is an unprecedented request. Um, so we are uh, committed to, and this is where um, Peggy's work really comes in, to scaling rental assistance so that it's not the case that only one out of four, one out of five households that's eligible for a voucher receives it. Um, we also have um, uh, increases in, in other categories. And again, I think part of what, uh, when you look at the American Rescue Plan and the FY22 budget, and even the American Jobs Plan, we want to be clear that like the, the work of ending homelessness is, is not just through the HUD continuum of care program or even the emergency solutions plan. Like we need to end homelessness by addressing housing needs across the board and we need to be able to leverage HUD programs across the board. And in many ways, the work of, of ending homelessness needs to be as much um, through our housing authorities um, who administer vouchers, as well as through city and state housing agencies to help to develop new housing um, as much as it is through continuing to care. So um, the name of the game will be partnerships. Um, and again, about how do we think not just about homelessness as something that um, our you know, SNAP's office does at HUD, but rather something that is done across all of HUD and is part of a larger strategy to address um, housing needs. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Peggy, if you have anything to add? Um, yeah. yeah, the one thing I would add is to lean into, especially in New York State, are the investments in tribal communities. Um, over in all of the, the Consolidated Appropriations Plan, the American Rescue Plan, and, and, um, and the HUD, uh, HUD budget, uh, we are making significant investments in or proposing pro specific investments in Indian country, which highlights what Richard said that, you know, this is, we're taking an all, you know, a, 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 a comprehensive approach to addressing housing and homelessness needs. And, um, and that includes for uh, on tribal lands. And then Laura, just quickly, I'll say like beyond HUD's budget, there's also some very cool and exciting things on the HHS side that um, folks should be aware of. Um, and I won't go into all the exhausting detail on that. In the American Rescue Plan, there was a 10% increase in federal matching funds for Medicaid funded home and community based services, which I'm happy to elaborate on more. That could be an exciting opportunity. I know it's not necessarily well understood by communities, so we'll be working to try to um, provide that. Um, there's additional opportunities um, through Medicaid on the FY22 budget. There's also some provisions related to maternal health. Um, and I think there's some exciting opportunities to look at, again, along this theme of housing as healthcare, we're looking at ways that um, increases that are requested in the HHS side of the budget uh, related to health and maternal health and other um, areas um, could create opportunities for support housing. Mm -hmm. And Peggy, do you have anything else to add about the American Jobs Plan that maybe Richard didn't cover? I know you're doing a lot of work in that area. Yeah, absolutely. And this is really where I think, you know, folks like me and Richard and our experience in support of housing really pays off because, you know, we know what it takes to build deeply affordable housing. And that LIHTC is only the foundation, but there are other pieces that have to come into play. And the way that we've done affordable housing in this country has been haphazard at best. So the American Jobs Package gives us a chance to bring our supportive housing lens to the work and show and, um, and try to help home, the housing trust fund, project-based rental assistance, mm -hmm. one, bring real re more resources to the table to partner with LIHTC, but also um, 
find ways to streamline those programs so that they align better. There's just so many different rules for each of those programs that, you know, that make it that unnecessary, that the only reason that there are differences is because they were created at different times with different Congresses and, and, um, and with not, not intentionality around them working together. They're created as discrete things rather than as we know, they have to come together to create deeply affordable housing. And that's really the vision for the jobs package is, is increasing housing supply. And what HUD's bringing to the table is how to increase supply for those who are at, uh, um, for people at the lowest income levels. Uh, the other piece of the jobs package is public housing and uh, the $40 billion in investment in public housing, which is critical in New York, as you all know, and bringing, and, and bringing resources through the capital, uh, the public housing capital formula fund, the operating funds, and but um, also creating um, the mechanisms that are needed to help leverage those dollars so that we can bring um, additional resources into public housing and uh, ex expedite the, the modernization of public housing. Because talk about a racial equity issue, public housing and what with well, the condition of, of way too many public housing units is a huge disservice to people of color that live in those units. And we need to do everything we can to as quickly as possible renovate that housing. And that's another the other component of, of the jobs package. The last piece is uh, is, is thinking about place-based strategies and, 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 and aligning health, safety, climate, jobs creation. So, and investments, not only in cities and states, but also in community-based organizations that are gonna be needed to advance those, those place-based strategies. So all of that is encompassed in the job plan, jobs plan. And the key piece that we need from all of you is to, um, is to continue the drumbeat of housing as infrastructure. And uh, that, that housing is a key, as key as streets and, um, uh, and the other, and, and bridges, and the other aspects of, uh, of, of what people say traditional infrastructure is. I would say that housing is traditional infrastructure. We just haven't invested in it in the way that we've needed to over too many decades. Right, absolutely. And I think that coordination that you're speaking to is so key. And I, I loved the fact that there was incentive money to talk about zoning, because I think we get ourselves tied up in knots about local zoning and and especially in a place like New York, where we've gone through all of the city owned in REM sites and we've gone through all of the vacant land to a, to a great degree. And so how can we look at zoning differently to try to really unlock other opportunities for housing? So I thought, you know, so, so comprehensive, even getting down to local planning, which is terrific. Um, and I think we've also taken a real look in New York State around even like how do RFPs align? What are the dates? What you know? What are the, what's the availability of funding? How do you access it? How does eligibility line up? And I, I so I also greatly appreciate it's not an easy thing to tackle, um, but HUD looking at it in a holistic way is is amazing. Um, and I also just before we end, and I can't believe we're almost time is almost up. Um, Richard, I did want you to speak about, I know the criminal legal system is dear to your heart. And as we hear experience in New York City, we have many people leaving prisons and jails and getting directly discharged into homelessness. Um, and if they are then going to go into COC funded housing, they don't have the chronicity to go in. So that keeps them in the system. That's just one exit. But how will HUD be approaching reentry? Yeah. Uh... Funny you should ask, Laura. We, this is definitely a priority of this administration. And I think soon you'll be hearing a little bit more about what some of the steps that we're taking in that front. Um, we want to tackle this um, comprehensively. Um, we have recognized that, you know, addressing the housing needs of people who are returning citizens from prisons and jails is an administration priority on a number of fronts. It, it helps us uh, advance our work to increase equity and address systemic racism given the the vast racial disparities we see in the justice system, as well as um, in the homelessness system and, and in housing outcomes. Um, it also addresses um, the president's priority to improve public safety, recognizing that uh, communities have been struggling with, with public safety, especially during COVID where um, crime and violent crime is up. And a big part of that is, is that if we don't help people to have second chances or third chances after they leave prison or jail, if we let them be discharged to homelessness and not have uh, um, access to 
um, services, um, as well as um, continue to have barriers to um, accessing housing assistance um, or even private housing because of criminal records, um, like we're, we're just contributing to crime. Um, we are taking a number of steps. Um, number one, um, there are opportunities through the American Rescue Plan's emergency housing vouchers, which um, uh, can serve people who are currently homeless, but people who are also at risk of homelessness, as well as people who are fleeing domestic violence. Among the populations specifically outlined in the um, notice that HUD put out, are, uh, of those who are at risk of homelessness are people who are leaving prisons or jails, who've been determined to be low income and also lack other social supports or resources. And so um, this is like the time where um, homeless service systems and um, supportive housing agencies and uh, housing authorities need to work with corrections and criminal justice agencies to begin uh, ensuring that um, any, every inmate who is in a prison or jail is assessed for housing status, not days before their release, but like on the day that they're admitted to the jail or prison and to track their housing status and to be able to determine which individuals truly are at risk of homelessness and who could benefit from a voucher or other assistance. Um, and so uh, that's some tools and guidance we'll be putting forward, but we are strongly encouraging communities to have those conversations to ensure that um, who receives these emergency housing vouchers um, is inclusive of people who are leaving prisons or jails that are at risk of homelessness. Um, in addition, we're taking some steps to ensure that, uh, you know, housing authorities, multifamily housing owners, uh, other supportive housing providers um, are conducting, if they do conduct criminal background screening, and certainly that's not required, um, that they're doing it in ways that conforms to the guidance that we issued back in 2016, um, which clarified that if you blanketly deny people housing on the basis of a criminal record, you are, uh, could be in violation of fair housing because of the racial disparity. That if you say, um, if you ask about criminal uh, uh, records on the application, uh, if you just blanketly deny, or if you take uh, a criminal history report and you just say, because they have a conviction on a history, we're gonna not accept them, um, you uh, essentially could be de facto violating fair housing. And so we'll be providing additional tools and guidance to help landlords, housing owners, housing providers uh, to stay on the right side of fair housing law. And to, if you are gonna look at criminal histories, make sure that you're only looking at the things that truly impact the health and safety, and even then, you must take into account all the other circumstances. So, Laura, we're working on a couple of fronts, looking at how we can use our resources, but also how we can modify and review our policies to make sure that we are giving people um, opportunities to succeed and use housing as a stable, as a platform and a foundation for successful reentry. Great, thank you, Richard. We look forward to hearing more. And again, it seems like a very comprehensive approach with existing tools, but then bringing in the new emergency housing vouchers really is part of that answer, which is which is amazing. Um, but I just, I hate to see you both go. I really appreciate that you spent your, your beginning of your morning with us. It's been a pleasure. I know it's just the beginning. We will, we will continue the conversation. And uh, again, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having us. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And I know, I think Diane is, Diane is with us. I'm gonna invite her to come on screen. Hi, Diane. Hey, Laura, how are you? Good, good, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Good, good, well, welcome. Um, I think you probably need no introduction, but to our community, uh, Diane Yentel, the President and CEO of the National Low Income Housing Coalition. We're so pleased to have with you, to, uh, with you today with us um, in these truly transformative times uh, that we have the whole country talking about affordable housing and really NLIHC has been the driver of that conversation. Uh, so we so greatly appreciate you joining us. And I know these 30 minutes are also gonna go very fast because you, you have your ear to the ground and we have so much to talk about. Um, but maybe just to start, Diane, could you just tell us a little bit about the National Low Income Housing Coalition for our audience members that may not be familiar? Sure, I'm glad to, and thanks again uh, very much for having me. I'm really glad to be here with um, with you and with Shinny and with um, so many amazing housing advocates in New York. Um, so the National Income Housing Coalition is a national advocacy organization. All of our work is about advancing federal policy solutions to make homes affordable, safe, and accessible for the lowest income people. And we focus purposefully on the lowest income people, extremely low income, very low income people, because the data is very clear that they're the only segment of the population for which there's an absolute shortage of homes that are affordable and available to them. And of course, that is why we have homelessness in our country. 
It's why we have nearly 10 million renter households who are paying at least half of their very limited incomes towards rent. And it's why we came to the very brink of an eviction tsunami in the middle of a, a global health emergency. So over the last year, we've spent most of our um, efforts focusing on keeping people experiencing homelessness safe and healthy and alive during the pandemic and preventing mass evictions among uh, extremely low income renters. And really your work has, has so much laid the foundation for where we are today, Diane. And it's just been incredible to be on this journey with your team. Um, and I wanted to start us off because everybody obviously is so uh, tied up with the American Jobs Plan or the Infrastructure Plan as we know it. Um, and I was wondering, could you give us your perspective on where do you think things are? Uh, we saw on Wednesday that President Biden discussed revisions on the size of the plan and how it would be paid for. Um, what do you think the path forward is at this moment? It's so hard to say. We are, we're, we're in this moment of just sort of excruciating waiting <laughs> to see what happens next. Uh, and these next few really hours and days will be critical to see which path we take. Um, you know, we're at, we have this extraordinary opportunity right now, just a once, it's not just a once in a generation, I think it's a once in a lifetime opportunity where everything is aligned. And we have now the president proposing $318 billion in housing investments alone in this multi-trillion dollar infrastructure package. And it's really notable that he started his negotiations with about $100 billion less in housing investments, which was already an extraordinary number. And then during it, he increased his request, which I, I can't remember another time that that's happened. Um, so we just have this opportunity to get these incredible investments if we target them right, you know, that, that could end homelessness and end housing poverty in our country. Um, but it's unclear whether we will be able to get it across the finish line, because as you said, now there are President Biden really is eager to have a bipartisan deal, and he has been negotiating um, with a group of Senate Republicans who so far seem to only be willing to come in much, much lower in terms of what they're willing to spend, who are not willing to make any investments in affordable housing in an infrastructure package that they would agree to, and who have very different ideas about how to spend the money. So there's a fine. There's probably what a, a final um, discussion today between President Biden and some of the Senate Republicans, uh, and it's just it's hard to know. Again, I, I think what what President Biden and some of the Democrats have said is, let's get whatever we can as a bipartisan agreement done, and then let's do the rest through reconciliation, uh, which is really risky. Mm -hmm. to, because there's certainly no guarantees if we get a smaller infrastructure package done that there will still be the momentum and the agreement just within the Democratic Party to do another multi-trillion dollar package right behind it. If you start to pick off what's most popular, it gets right. much harder to get it all through. Um, so we'll see. We'll see in the next week um, what the Democrats decide to do here. If they find that they can't come to an agreement that's palatable to them with the Republicans, then they'll go it alone like they did with the American Rescue Plan and move a, a, a major package under reconciliation. And then, the, <clears throat> and again, that's where there's truly an opportunity in the next three to six months to get major investments for affordable housing. And we'll have to mobilize like we never have before to get it done. Absolutely, and, and hope that uh, Joe Manchin follows, follows suit, right? Because uh, with reconciliation, we need 50 members and uh, are counting on him. Um, but yes, no, very, it's nail biting right now <laughs> and trying to see the path forward and really hoping with all of these amazing resources on the table that we're gonna come through. And I, I agree with you really watching the ball on if some of it gets done through a bipartisan way, and then what can we then push through through reconciliation and really keeping the drumbeat up to get all of those resources on the table. Right. Um, and of course it goes a, a tremendous way in adding resources 
and it's just the tip of the iceberg. And I would love for you to walk us through the housed campaign because really echoing and picking up, um, you know, President Biden's desire to make housing a human right and to have access to rental assistance for all, to move it into an entitlement. Uh, so talk to us about the housed campaign. Yeah, so the housed campaign is is our campaign to achieve universal, stable, affordable housing. And it's really about building off of the momentum and some of the success that we've had over the last year and the movement that we've built and broadened and strengthened during that year to keep it going, keep that momentum going to seize this really once in a lifetime opportunity that we have right now. Um, and, and it's, it's such an opportunity because as you say, you know, we have a president who talks about housing as a human right and committed, he committed to achieving universal rental assistance for all households who need it. That is light years ahead of even where President Obama was with his aggressive affordable housing initiatives. You know, this is, this is completely unprecedented to have a president make such a robust commitment and now we have to hold him to that commitment because he made a lot of great commitments. <laughs> he made a lot of big promises and it's hard to keep them all. So we need to hold him to that commitment. And that's um, in part what the House campaign is about. So the priorities of the House campaign are many of the same ones that many of us have been working on for years or for decades. It's about the long-term solutions and the long-term investments to make homes affordable for the lowest income people. So. One, we are pushing for universal housing vouchers so that four out of four households who need rental assistance receive it. We're pushing for, um, we have to preserve the affordable housing exists, that exists today and we have to build more. So that means repairing public housing, at least $70 billion to repair public housing is what's needed. And we need to build more affordable housing that's affordable to the lowest income people. So we're pushing for at least $40 billion for the housing trust fund. And as you said, zoning is a real issue in many communities across the country. It prevents the construction of any apartments, especially affordable apartments. And unless we address local zoning, even if we get these federal resources, we won't be able to use them. So we're also pushing for um, the federal government to really be bold um, and tie these trillions of dollars that are going to local communities to at least some incentives and ideally requirements for local communities to address uh, local zoning. So uh, rental assistance for all, preserve and build more affordable housing. We also need to have permanent emergency rental assistance available when needed. So we're pushing to create a national housing stabilization fund. This is something we were working on before the pandemic and we had bipartisan legislation introduced in the Senate for it. The idea at that point was to create a pilot program, but I'd say 2020 and 2021 are our pilot program for emergency rental assistance. We've learned a lot about what works and what doesn't. And it's time to create a permanent national housing stabilization fund. And then finally, we have to rebalance the power that tilts so heavily in favor of landlords and at the expense of low-income renters and predominantly renters of color and especially black women who are disproportionately likely to be evicted. So we're pushing for a whole set of really robust renter protections like right to counsel and just cause eviction and source of income discrimination protections and so on. Mm -hmm. And for all of these buckets of solutions, we have to not only push to get the major investments that we need, but we have to recognize that a lot of these programs don't work for people of color, um, for black and brown and indig indigenous people. And so if we're gonna truly recognize the history of racist housing policies that created many of the disparities that exist today, we have to now really advance the anti-racist housing policies that can address and correct and improve these situations. So when we're talking about major expansions of rental assistance, we have to also be talking about and advancing solutions to, for source of income discrimination protections, for other 
changes to the program to make sure it actually works for low-income people of color who need the resources the most. So that's the House campaign. Those are our long-term goals. And again, we have this incredible opportunity now to potentially achieve many of them through this infrastructure spending package. So we launched the campaign together with partners like Shinny um, in order to really seize this moment and get as much of this done as we can in the next year to 18 months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're so happy to be a partner uh, with you in that effort with the New York Housing Conference. And many of our members on the call today are very engaged in it. And I, I appreciate, um, again, very comprehensive looking at all the aspects. And I think truly for communities of color, like what, what are the barriers to actually getting those resources? What gatekeeping and access issues do we have? Because that can be a huge barrier even to application. And we do absolutely through our very competitive housing market in New York, uh, rely on source of income discrimination, uh, statutes here in the city and the state to help protect people who are looking for renting However, without kind of the, the workforce to go out and test and see where landlords are not adhering to it, we, we've left ourselves a little disabled. So although the, the state law and the city laws are on the books, uh, we don't have the kind of the, the workforce behind it to really test and make sure that people aren't being discriminated against. And so really hoping to also build on those resources um, and of course, universal rental assistance, like music to our ears for building more supportive housing in, this, in the city and the state of New York. And how would you see that kind of rolling out? Is it, is it the kind of thing, you know, in a dream world, it, we get it and it's an entitlement or is it something that is kind of comes in a slower way? Like we just saw this huge infusion of 200,000 vouchers, which is incredible with the FY22 budget. Yeah, I think it's much more likely, and frankly, in a lot of ways, best if we do it in steps, right? We, we, I'm not sure that we're ready to overnight say we have universal vouchers available. We have to think about market implications. We have to think about the improvements and the reforms to the program to make sure it works for the lowest income people. But we're certainly ready for more right now, more vouchers and all the vouchers we need um, soon. So I think what the Biden administration is doing uh, makes a lot of sense, which is in the appropriations bill now, making this request for 200,000 new incremental vouchers, as Richard said, you know, that would be the largest one-time expansion of the program since its inception um, and would be you know, a tremendous help to many low-income renters who are struggling today. We have a lot of work to do to get that done through the appropriations process. Uh, and then in the meantime, I think that the Biden administration and others intend to start having discussions internally and externally with stakeholders about the policy reforms that are needed to improve the program and about the best ways to expand it over time. So for example, if we're expanding vouchers by 200,000 or at some point by 500,000 or a million, how do we distribute those vouchers? What's the best distribution and administration of the, of the vouchers? Um, who do we prioritize? <clears throat> you know, is that the best way to do it incrementally? Do we think about the populations with the greatest needs and start by serving them? Certainly people experiencing homelessness, chronic homelessness, uh, families and shelters would be at the top of that list. Um, I think there's still a lot of questions to figure out there. But again, we've made real headway in having the president and Secretary Fudge and, and, and Peggy and, and Richard so committed mm -hmm. to working towards expanding Section 8 vouchers. We also have just next week, um, the House Financial Services Committee Chairwoman, Maxine Waters, is holding a full committee hearing that's entitled Universal Housing Vouchers, Ending Homelessness, which just in and of itself is tremendous. You know, we've changed the conversation. Um, and so we're, we're making real progress. Amazing. And I, I think that it's been very interesting to watch the um, emergency housing voucher process and trying to think about even having an infusion of 8,000 vouchers. What does that mean for New York? Um, and also the connection with the continuum of care and really looking at who is most in need and setting the priorities, um, I think is also was a really insightful thing for HUD to kind of put out. Yeah. Um, and really forces a conversation um, and really forces the 
the PHAs and the continuum of care and the, and the homeless system, the housing providers to really get in conversation about how to get this done. So it's been, I agree with you, kind of a, a little mini experiment for what hopefully will then be, if we get the 200,000 vouchers, if we then continue to ratchet it up, we've, we, we're learning a lot along the way. Um, yeah, and actually, if I could just say on that too, I think um, that, that we had just have such a tremendous um, obligation and responsibility and need to make sure that the resources, these new resources that are going to communities are used well. Yes. Um, and, you know, quickly and within the time needed and that we can show results from them, whether it's the 10 uh, the ten billion dollars in funding for homelessness from home and the new vouchers, or the forty-six and a half billion dollars for emergency rental assistance, if we can't show that this money is working and that communities know what to do and how to use these funds, it's going to make it much harder for us to convince Congress now to invest three hundred or more billion dollars for housing investments. So it's it's very much tied together. Of course, we all, I know everybody on this call um, cares deeply about making sure these funds work so that they help people who are desperate for help and badly in need of affordable housing. We also just need to keep in mind that our long-term success depends on our getting this right in the next few months and how we spend these funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, it's, it's, I think we're gearing up. I think the challenge of, of, and, and it's, you know, it's a, it's an amazing moment to have the resources that we have coming out of the pandemic where everyone has just been stretched to the hilt. Yeah. And there was a lot of kind of retrenchment when, when budgets went, you know, went crazy uh, with all of the additional expenses and spending and the less of the income coming in because we shut down for so long. So I really see our government partners like now ratcheting it up and, and have a lot of respect for the work that they're doing to try to kind of get this off the ground because I think everyone feels that we absolutely need to prove that we can do it in order to continue to get more resources yeah. uh, to the table. Um, so there's a lot of people, a lot of people working on it. Yeah. Um, Diane, I wanted to also, you know, you have been such a light on the eviction moratorium. And have really been out there, you know, screaming from the rafters uh, that it needs to be continued, that we're facing a tsunami of potential evictions. And we in New York State, we've just rolled out our emergency rental assistance program. Uh, it's just less than a week old. Um, and talk to us about what you've seen nationally. Um, have you seen any um, great ways that it's been done? What do you think is needed in terms of long-term policy change? Just kind of give your perspective. Well, you know, I really want to congratulate uh, you and other advocates in, in New York for New York's Emergency Rental Assistance Program. It is one of the last ones to get up and running. Um, but, you know, I said from the beginning when this, when this money was appropriated, it's not about getting the money out fast, necessarily. It's about getting it out right and getting it out well and ensuring that we are getting it to the people who need it the most. And that takes more time to design accessible programs, to do the outreach that's necessary to reach the lowest income and the most marginalized people in the most marginalized communities. So I, I and New York is an example of that, like the program that, that was created in New York, that it explicitly serves undocumented immigrants, that it you know, assists extremely low income people with back rent and future rent payments. And there are, mo there are many best practices in that program. So. I wanna congratulate all the advocates and all of the work that went into designing that program so well. Of course, now the work is getting the money out quickly because now, now we are in a bit of a rush. Yes. <laughs> now it's against a clock because the, eviction more, the, the national eviction moratorium expires at the end of the month. And while we think it should be extended at least until these historic emergency rental assistance funds are expended, um, I am doubtful that it will be extended. And in fact, the Supreme Court is now involved and mm -hmm. there could be a ruling uh, soon that may lift the protections even sooner than the end of the month. Um, so we do have to make sure that this money is getting out uh, quickly to tenants who need it to stay stably housed. 
And I'd say there's really varying success um, across the country. There are some places that are doing it very well that did design accessible programs for the lowest income people that are reviewing applications, accepting applications, getting money out, writing checks, getting money in people's pockets. There's other communities that are either creating unnecessary obstacles and roadblocks that are preventing the lowest income people from getting the resources that they need, um, or they have very limited capacity to be able to handle the deluge of applications that have come in. So we've been doing at, at the National Income Housing Coalition, we've been tracking all emergency rental assistance programs from the start of the pandemic. You know, in 2020, they were funded through much more limited funds made available in the CARES Act. And by the end of 2020, we were tracking about 600 programs. Now we're tracking close to a thousand programs across the country, about 400 of them are with the, the new bigger emergency rental assistance funds. And we've been doing research, research with partners like the uh, Furman, Furman Center at NYU and others um, to learn from program administrators about what's working and what's not, to highlight best practices, to put forward you know, principles for model programs. We've worked really closely with the White House and the Department of Treasury to put out much better guidance that makes the programs much more tenant friendly and tenant accessible. Um, so we're hopeful that in the next few weeks and certainly in the next few months, that this money will really start getting out much more quickly to the people who need it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, um, we're hoping we have a we have our system up and running, and and really hope to be getting the money out the door. Um, that's troubling about the Supreme Court, of course, uh, and hoping yeah. that that doesn't come to fruition. But um, can see a scenario where it might. Um, so yes, all the more urgency. Um, and also wanted to talk about the National Housing Trust Fund, which has also been um, a major uh, initiative and, and backing from, from your organization. Um, it took a decade to pass, and now we are starting to see the growth of the program. Um, New York State receives about 70 million this year. What more can be done, do you think, to grow the program? Yeah, the program is working and it's working well. And the biggest challenge with the program is that it's so woefully underfunded given the need. You know, the National Housing Trust Fund this year it, it received its largest allocation ever, which was about $750 million when we have a shortage of 7 million apartments affordable and available to lowest income people throughout the country. So the program was designed really well to meet the greatest and um, clearest needs to build and preserve apartments affordable to extremely low income renters. Uh, but the funding is just a drop in the bucket. Communities are using it well and we're able to now um, show how, you know, we're tracking very closely what communities are building and preserving and, and they're incredibly compelling stories about uh, new homes affordable to really the low, extremely low income, very marginalized people, survivors of domestic violence, people who are formerly chronically homeless, youth aging out of foster care, um, and on and on. So now, you know, over the last several years, we've been able to build some really strong congressional champions for the program. Elizabeth Warren was one of the first to come out to say, we need $45 billion for the Housing Trust Fund annually, not 700 million. Uh, and that's building up momentum. And again, now we got to a place where President Biden and Secretary Fudge are proposing $45 billion for the Housing Trust Fund. And Congress uh, Chairwoman Maxine Waters put it into her Housing is Infrastructure Act. So this is one of our top priorities for the House campaign to, to get this done in the infrastructure package. And we really, we have an incredible opportunity to do it. I'd say too that um, um, Majority Leader Schumer is clearly a very important actor in all of this. And again, to say thanks and congratulations to all of the New York advocates who have made him um, such a champion for affordable housing, especially for public housing, but also for the Housing Trust Fund and other solutions. And just to keep keep that relationship going, keep yes. building his support, keep having him focus um, on this as a major priority in the infrastructure package is going to be incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a, we have an amazing delegation. Uh, wow. You know, couldn't be happier. But I, we know that there's a lot of competing needs uh, in the state. Yeah. 
And so happy always to keep beating the drum on housing. And um, so we just have a few minutes left. It's been so great, Diane, but you know, you're amazing at Twitter. So tell us <laughs> what do you like about the platform? What, what works, what doesn't work? Um, so I found with Twitter that like you can't fake it. You have to really love Twitter to be good at Twitter. <laughs> and I sort of live and breathe Twitter. Like that's where I get my news. That's where I go to to find out what's happening. It's, you know, that's where I follow major reporters or key advocates and so on. So when you when you use Twitter that way, when you follow, um, when you go there first to get your news and get your source of sources of information, then it becomes really natural to use it as a way to, to communicate and to convey. And I find it to be an incredibly powerful platform for that um, when, when it's something that just feels natural and you're able to do regularly because you do have to do it regularly and keep, you know, reply when people use it as a way to have conversations and not just give information. Um, but it's an incredibly powerful platform. And I find that I am able to reach and have conversations with many, many people that I wouldn't otherwise in, with all of the other advocacy and outreach that we do. Twitter is a unique place for good and for bad yeah. and a unique audience and a, a unique place to interact. And it's absolutely a place to engage with and educate and learn from people that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. Wonderful. I know I'm an active follower of yours. <laughs> I know where to go for the latest uh, latest news and what's happening at the Capitol. Um, but Diane, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's been such a pleasure to have you with us. And we absolutely look forward to all of our work uh, moving forward. Thanks so much again for having me. And thanks really for your tremendous leadership, Laura. Yeah. Thanks, Diane. Have a great day. And thank you to everyone who's joined us for this conversation and to Peggy and Richard again. It's been wonderful. And please again, join us for our Friday Forum series. We'll be back again next Friday. Uh, so look for emails on that and register and everyone have a wonderful day and a great weekend.